Marketing and Communications Manager at Data Conversion Laboratory, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know we will allow time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers. So please write your questions in the chat area as they come to mind. If we don't have time to answer them all, we will make them available on our website. <clears throat> it is my pleasure to introduce to you Elliot Kimber of Contracts Limited. Elliot Welcome and have a great one. Talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, EPUB3, uh, HTML5, and DITA, and, and where things are at the moment. This is a little bit about me. Uh, mostly I've just been doing this for, for a very long time. Um, so we want to talk, uh, uh, really come up to speed on, on EPUB and HTML5. What are they? Uh, where where they come in the last year or so? Um, and, and where did we come from? And then how is uh, DITA, EPUB3, and HTML5 related, how can you get to these new uh, delivery technologies from, from your DITA content? So H EPUB and HTML5, what are they? So EPUB, of course, is, is a standard for electronic books. Um, you know, if you have uh, uh, iBooks or, or uh, Barnes & Noble um, Nook or, uh, or Kindle, you're familiar with the, the concept of electronic books. Um, EPUB itself is a standard published by the International Digital Publishing Forum, IDPF, and the current version of the EPUB standard is EPUB 3. So EPUB 3 as a standard has been around for quite a while, but EPUB 3 is, um, is very new. And EPUB is used by all the ebook readers except the Amazon Kindle, right? So Amazon has their own uh, proprietary format that's similar to but, but different from EPUB. Uh, but even with the Kindle, you can use an EPUB as the input to the, the Kindle uh, book uh, uh, publication process. So for all intents and purposes, all electronic book delivery can be done through through EPUB one way or another. So EPUB 2. So EPUB 2 was published in 2010 and it's the format that uh, all the readers today support. Um, well, I use is going to support EPUB 2. And it's an HTML-based format. So the actual content inside that EPUB package is fundamentally HTML pages. There can be graphics in there and so forth. Um, EPUB 2 had limited support for CSS, limited support for scripting, limited support for media embedding. So it was well suited for text only or text primary books, you know, your, your novels and, and, and whatnot. But it didn't work as well for uh, richer media documents like textbooks, um, uh, more sophisticated trade books, magazines, that sort of thing. Um, the other thing about EPUB 2 is it had complex and, and EPUB specific navigation structure. So one of the challenges with, with generating an EPUB 2, uh, for example, if you were, if you were trying to do that from, from some XML source, was you actually, it was quite a bit of work to produce the, the navigation structures and get those right, meet the rules of EPUB 2. So that, that was annoying, at least for those of us who had to implement those output transfers. So EPUB 3. EPUB 3 in June 2014, so EPUB 3 is now uh, a standard, and it's based on HTML5. Uh, the other thing you can do in EPUB 3 that's new is you can use SVG for pages. So if you have a fixed layout book, you could, at least in theory, generate SVG images of those pages rather than trying to do with HTML5. However, that use of SVG within EPUB 3 is not recommended. The, the readers don't support it as far as, don't support it well anyway, as far as I can tell. Um, EPUB 3 uses HTML5 navigation structures rather than the older EPUB specific navigation structures. That's nice. It means that a single, um, if you already have uh, a transform, for example, that can produce HTML5 and HTML5 navigation structures, you can adapt that directly to your EPUB 3 output. Um, much better uh, CSS and JavaScript support. So they put a lot of effort into the EPUB 3 specification to support those, those higher designs, those more interactive, uh, more visual EPUBs and to, to try to do what they could to, to make that work in the, you know, in the context of, of, of readers where there has to be some you know, consistency and, and interoperability among these different uh, reader devices. Uh, better media support so that you can, you know, have, uh, make it easier to embed media into your EPUB 3 and hopefully have, have it be more likely that that media is going to work in, in different readers that, that you're, that that EPUB 3 might, might be, uh, read through. 
Um, you can also include uh, the older EPUB2 navigation structure. So that means that you can have a single EPUB package, a single file, um, that's both an EPUB2 and an EPUB3, uh, which is really a requirement for, at least for now, uh, given that many of the Do not support EPUB 3 directly. Um, hardened in the context of, of HTML5 and general web practice over the last, you know, three, four, five years. Um, I provide more control over styling, so uh, putting in support for uh, embedded fonts, um, allowing you to have a fixed layout, uh, more support for CSS styling, and generally making your EPUB readers behave much more close, uh, you know, more closely to what you would get from a modern web browser, hopefully. Um, adding more accessibility features, right, accessibility is a really important aspect of electronic books generally. Um, electronic books historically have, have been driven largely or, or at least in, in large part by their ability to support to be accessible, to support good, and of course better support for, for embedded media. So what are some of the, the important features of EPUB 3? So it's a subset of HTML5, so the, the, the actual content pages uh, are going to be marked up in HTML5, and they put a lot of focus on taking advantage of HTML5 semantic markup, and then added a number of EPUB semantic extensions to those. So you, essentially you can have more precisely named and labeled navigation structures, and that helps to make your content more accessible. So somebody who's using, um, you know, uh, a screen reader to navigate through your publication, by giving your navigation structures more um, meaningful names, it makes it easier for that person to know where they are in that publication or, or where they need to go if they're trying to navigate through your navigation structures. Um, MathML for math, SVG for vector graphics. Right, those are two key standards for the display parts of your, of your content. Um, CSS2, uh, 2.1, a few restrictions there, and then plus CSS3 speech properties, so that you can use the CSS3 um, uh, audio controls uh, to help provide clues for how the content should be spoken. Again, very important for accessibility. Um, embedded fonts, so in CSS3, you can embed fonts into your EPUB, Reference those fonts from your from your style sheets, and hopefully have you know more control, or at least uh, you know with readers that support it, more control over the over the visual aspects of your book. Um, SVG for fixed layout pages, like I said, that that's not recommended, but the you know, EPUB three standard does allow it. Um, you can also use HTML. Plus, absolutely position CSS for books. Um, uh, there's, um, that's what they're actually doing under covers. They're using absolutely position CSS and HTML to give you a much more um, controlled design within your EPUB and support for scripting. So they tried to standardize how uh, readers should support scripting, uh, how, how it should fall back, but but do you know make it part of the standard that you can do scripting within your EPUB. So that that allows you to have um, you know, more interactive documents have, for, for example, you might have custom reader applications that can take advantage of scripting to do things like uh, interactions in a learning environment or, or within textbooks, something like that. So the, the mechanism is at least provided in the standard. Um, now, that's all really cool stuff, but then the question is, well, what readers support this? Um, at the moment, There's really not much in the way of EPUB 3 support, and there's the only the only reader that I'm aware of that currently supports EPUB 3 more or less completely is Readium's um, is the Readium reader, which has been sponsored for the ID, IDPF uh, to serve as a reference implementation of, of EPUB 3, um, and that's I mean that's useful especially for testing because that was always one of the challenges. You know, I could generate an EPUB 3, uh, but I had no way to test whether it was correct or not because there were no readers for it. The Readium reader does give you a way to test that. But it's not 
not intended as a production and delivery environment. It's not, you know, it's just a, right now it's just a Chrome uh, browser plugin. Um, it's not, for example, a library that you could use as a basis for some commercial reader product. Um, for commercial readers that, that we're familiar with, iBooks provides partial support for EPUB 3. So it certainly, as far as I know, the most complete. You know, they're closest to an EPUB 3 reader. Um, so what that means in practice is that if you want to produce EPUB 3, and that would certainly be a good idea because, you know, someday the, the support would be there, you need to produce uh, uh, EPUB 3, EPUB 2 packages. So that's an EPUB that contains both the EPUB 3 navigation structures and content as well as the EPUB 2 navigation structures and possibly, if, if required, although it shouldn't be necessary, um, EPUB 2 specific HTML pages as well. Um, and that way those, those EPUBs can be used in any reader that supports EPUB 2 or any reader that supports EPUB 3. As far as I know, that's what all the publishers producing EPUB 3s today are actually doing. They're producing EPUB 3, EPUB 2. Um, so So the current state of EPUB 3, right, significant or flexible, um, a lot of potential for high quality documents, right, so if you're, if you're a publisher and you're moving beyond just putting all of your, your novels out in EPUB, you want to start doing things like, you know, more highly designed children's books or uh, trade books that have more design aspects or, or even something, you know, starting to approach, uh, you know, your highly designed uh, art books or, or magazines, there's a possibility of doing that with EPUB 3. I'm not sure it's Anybody can really read those today, but the, 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 the underlying technology supported them. Um, obviously, the lack of reader support makes the value of EPUB 3 uh, somewhat limited, which is, which is unfortunate. Um, so my recommendation is as far as I know, there's what publishers doing. Produce those EPUB. Um, I mean, it's nice that the EPUB 3 standard, I mean, EPUB 3 has been standardized, that was done last fall, but until the readers catch up uh, with the standard, then it's, it's, it's annoying. All right, so HTML5. So HTML5 has been really the, you know, the buzzword in the web community for about the, uh, almost the last 10 years now. I'm trying, to, trying to remember when I first heard about HTML5, I was like, oh, that's something we should track. You know, quite a long time ago now. So HTML5. Um, is, you know, this is a new flavor of HTML, has, uh, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, HTML5, HTML5, HTML5. But what does HTML5 really mean? Really what HTML5 means is you have basically the same HTML markup you've always had, some, you know, some important differences, but nothing too, too big in there. But then combined with more general, scripting infrastructure um, across, across different browsers, um, you know, the difficulty of, of creating uh, interactive and, and responsive uh, websites with, with older web technology. HTML5 has more semantic structures, so you, you have things like a navigation tag, you have the section tag, you have the article tag, and these start to give you a little more semantic structure than, than you had uh, historically in HTML. It's not, I mean, if you're, if you're coming from uh, a digital world or, or you know, an XML for documentation world, it seems like incredibly weak semantics, but, it's, you know, compared to HTML5 traditionally, it's, you know, sort of groundbreaking stuff. Um, but it does give you some more semantic hooks to at least distinguish navigation from, from content and be able to distinguish some of the key uh, uh, container structures within, within your content. You know, this is an article, this is a section within that article. Um, lots of features for interaction in graphics and a focus on, on scripting and standard browser APIs. So it was, one of the things that HTML5 did was basically they said, let's standardize the API for interacting with HTML in the browser, which had never been attempted before. 
Um, that seems to be seems to be working okay. HTML5 mandates MathML and SVG for math content and and um, vector graphic content. So that's nice. We have you know some some standards there for those important content uh, uh, standards. Standardizes media media embedding. You know, when HTML5 first tried to do this, they tried to say you know there's only ever going to be one. Bit You know, codec, and this is going to be it. Or that you know, if you use one of those four, it's probably going to work all the time. So at least try to avoid issues around having custom plugins and having to have you know proprietary uh, uh, ways of viewing videos and other media in different browsers. Um, right. So so HTML5 fundamentally enables more interactive and responsive websites, and you know, especially with the rise of different devices. So you want your website to work well on a, on a laptop. On a, on, a, on, a, uh, on a phone, on a tablet, um, HTML5 makes that easier. Um, the reason HTML5 makes that easier is mostly because it gives you, it, it sets up a framework in which you can have, um, not necessarily standard, but but you know, well established and generally used uh, programming frameworks. To JavaScript framework, CSS uh, frameworks, that's important. Um, now, to create a working HTML5 website, it does require some significant programming. So it's not like you just get all this stuff for free, but it's much easier. The cost of getting a sophisticated website uh, implemented uh, should, should be lower than it has been in the past because most of what you need to do comes from libraries, and now you're configuring those libraries and you know, branding things uh, for your own use. So HTML5 was published as a recommendation in October 2014. So it's a, it's a worldwide web consortium uh, recommendation. So that's that's good. I mean, HTML5 was seemed to be in this state where it might not ever be, you know, actually published as a standard. But that, they were able to do that. That's good, and so hopefully, the, uh, you know, data is always changing as the HTML5 spec evolved in, in unpredictable and chaotic ways. Hopefully, that's much better than it was before. Um, it's certainly well supported in modern browsers, so you know, all the browsers you're likely to be using, unless you're, you know, have users stuck back on IE7 or something, which I understand that happens. All your HTML5 stuff should work pretty well, and of course, there's lots of JavaScript packages and frameworks out there that you can choose from that you know your web designers can use. Um, uh, quickly and easily. Well, I say easily, probably not that easily. All right, so that's HTML5. So HTML5 has really, you know, I think, you know, come to a, a reasonable point of stability. The, you know, the standard's been approved, the technology's there, the libraries are there. People, you know, your web designers, your web implementers. So that's all. That's all very good. So then, how does this relate to data, right? So, a couple of things. Of course, if we have data content, we're going to be delivering that on the web. We'd like to be able to produce HTML5 from that. If we have data content, we'd like to be able to produce EPUBs from that. We'd like to be able to produce EPUB3. And the fact that EPUB3 is in fact based on HTML5 makes those two things, you know, related in, in interesting ways. At least from the standpoint of hopefully getting some. Simplification or, or or code reuse in our in our output implementation. The other thing that's happening is DITA 1.3, right? So the current version of DITA is DITA 1.2 that was published uh, about five years ago. <clears throat> so it actually predates uh, EPUB 3 and HTML5, you know, by a number of years. Because we knew those things were coming at the time we did. One two, but you know, with my ML5, and in particular to build in uh, support for MathML and SVG into the base data standard. So in DITA 1.3, um, you know, it comes out of the box as defined by by the data technical committee with MathML and SVG integrated and, and markup to make those things uh, relatively easy to use in your document. Uh, we also added a new element called div, which is modeled directly on the, the HTML div element, has exactly the same purpose. It's just a generic container 
can use it for lots of things. Then also we, we enhance the object element in Vita uh, by allowing you to use QRefs for it to make that a little more flexible. The object element is modeled directly on the HTML object element. So it's a way that you can create references to, um, you know, plugins or, uh, you know, specific media objects that aren't just simple references to, to graphics or video. Um, and so the object element is important for uh, creating publications that integrate media objects into them. Uh, another thing that we added is um, new <coughs> new features in Data 1.3 for, for authoring and producing cross-deliverable links. So if you have if you're if you're publishing multiple publications in a single website, you'd like to have links that go across those publications. Uh, in Data 1.2, there was no way to actually author those links uh, except as direct references to the HTML that was going to be published. Data 1.3, you can author those links in a way uh, that's independent of how it's going to be published. Then when you go to publish it, those links can be generated. One of the things that that new feature could potentially enable is using using uh, multiple uh, data maps that are can be published independently to represent the content of, of a website or content of the publication part of a corporate website. Um, we're, we're still working out whether or not that's useful or not, but the, but the potential is there. I started to experiment with that in the context of a couple of client projects, and we'll see see how that works. All right, so if I want to get HTML5 from my data, which I probably want to do, um, how do I do that? Well, so there's a couple of a couple of options. There's um, uh, two open source options. So with the Data Open Toolkit 2.0, which is the version of the toolkit um, that's going to support and will do today and, and will more in the future support Data 1.3, it now has the option to generate HTML5 pages rather than XHTML pages. So up until the toolkit 2.0, the did open toolkit always just produced XHTML pages. And if you wanted to get HTML5 out of the toolkit, HTML pages that are HTML5. It's not addressing the larger issue with HTML5, which is, you know, the whole um, uh, JavaScript and CSS uh, underpinning of your website. For that, the Data for Publishers uh, project's HTML5 transform um, generates HTML5 and also provides features for managing the theme. So that's the JavaScript and CSS that goes along with it, um, allows you to uh, publish your data content to a website where the, the JavaScript CSS stuff that you've you know, configured separately and develop that however you do it, it then gets published along with your HTML. And it also has support for generating appropriate navigation structures and so forth so that you can generate a more or less complete HTML website or, or components of an HTML5 website with all of the interaction stuff, all the styling stuff there all, all together. And we've tried to design that so that it's you know, relatively easy to customize and adapt if you want brand stuff, if you want to swap in different uh, uh, HTML5 libraries to get different effects in your output. That should be relatively easy to do. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully we haven't made it any harder than it needs to be. Uh, for commercial solutions, there's a number of options. Uh, there's the Sweet Solution Suite Help uh, product. Oxygen um, includes an HTML5-based web help application, Nikon Data Web, Titania Delivery. Uh, those are all HTML5-based solutions. They all work very nicely. Um, and other other offerings are coming all the time. So we're, I think we're starting to see, I don't know, explosion is probably a little strong, but we're certainly starting to see lots of tooling, you know, pretty robust. mature uh, uh, tooling, web tools come online, so that's good. All right, if you want to get EPUB 3 from your from your data, um, there's the open source data for publishers EPUB transformation type. So the EPUB transformation type has been around for a while. Um, this last year we uh, enhanced it to support EPUB 3. 
um, and that's uh, thanks largely to HarperCollins Publishers, who funded that work, um, and also Human Kinetics uh, did a lot of work to make sure all the details of the ePub reader we were, we were generating that that was taken care of. Um, so I, be, I want to thank both of those companies for, for their support there. So the end result is that you can now produce uh, EPUB 2s, EPUB 3s, and, and EPUB 2, EPUB 3 uh, combination EPUBs. Uh, from your data source um, at the moment, uh, fixed format EPUBs today. Um, but what you, can, what you can do is you can produce publication ready EPUBs from your data source. Um, so there are there are a number of publishers, including Human Kinetics and HarperCollins, obviously, uh, who are now producing EPUBs ready to go into their uh, final QA process and into their final um, you know channel delivery uh, uh, publishing process uh, straight out of data content. And uh, that's that's very nice. All right. So if you had a need for fixed layout EPUB from data, it's not available today. Um, I've been thinking about this, you know, as I've been implementing the EPUB stuff over the last few years. It should be relatively easy to implement. Using any of the existing um, XSL of the your, your fixed layout EPUBs. Um, Nobody's nobody's actually asked for that seriously enough to, 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 to pay for the work. If somebody needed that, you know, it could be done, but it's not a priority um, for the, the data for publishers project just as, as you know, something I'm going to do in my spare time. Um, you could also generate SVG pages from, from your data content, um, but like I said, the EPUB readers don't handle those, those SVG pages well, so I don't think that's useful to pursue. Um, all right, so that's that's a quick overview of, of where we are with EPUB, uh, EPUB, HTML5, how you can get to those things from your data content. And so I wanted to show uh, some, some screenshots. Um, uh, an EPUB published by Human Kinetics. It's an exercise book. So Human Kinetics is a publisher they publish um, exercise and um, I'm trying to remember the exact how, to, how, how they exactly describe their publishing. But essentially, books on exercise, sports, um, uh, those sorts of subjects. So their books tend to be graphically heavy. They also have a lot of media, um, you know, because a lot of their books are you know how to perform some some sports action. Um, and their the content of their books is you know can be pretty pretty sophisticated here. So you can see. Uh, here we have an exercise, a little bit of an exercise book. So it's describing an exercise. It's showing you uh, the graphic and so forth. Um, so a, you know, these are not highly designed books, but they're they're Here's uh, the same textbook uh, in the version that they published with the embedded media. So um, this is a screenshot. Obviously, I can't click the video, but the video does, in fact, play. Um, and so they have a number of these videos in the book. And that's all done, again, through, um, through data, going through the data for publishers, EPUB uh, output generator. Um, HTML5 output, uh, this is a website. Um, that's for the University of Ottawa, and it is a, a database. All the content is database. It's published HTML5 through the uh, Data for Publishers HTML5 uh, transform, and then um, Bertrand Lafort, who uh, is responsible for producing this website and also for implementing the HTML5 uh, stuff in, in Data for Publishers, did the work to actually do the, the layout design. So this is this is an example of of content that's really pretty different from your typical data 
uh, technical documentation, but you can see there's there's some nice interactivity features, uh, some nice layout design here stuff. So this is again just from from data content. All the work really went into the you know the JavaScripting and the CSS styling uh, behind this website. The actual generation of the HTML pages themselves is, is pretty straightforward. Um, here's Oxygen's Web Help. So this is another HTML5 based application. So this is their documentation uh, presented through their their Web Help. Um, I guess that's my last one. Yeah, I was trying to find more examples, and, and I didn't have more that I could get permission to use in the short term. Um, we have a client that's uh, hopefully today going live with an HTML5 based website for all their product documentation. Well, unfortunately, because they they hadn't gone live as of the time of this webinar, I couldn't I couldn't show it to you. Um, here's some resources. So the IDPF uh, owns the EPUB3 standard. HTML5 recommendation, uh, the Open Toolkit, of course, did it for publishers and, and myself. Um, so, how are we doing? The top, I guess we're doing all right. So, I will open it up for questions. Well, thank you, Elliot. Very informative webinar indeed. Um, the first question that has come in is regarding EPUB 3, uh, EPUB 3 support. Is this a software upgrade, or is the current hardware unable to support the new version? So you're talking about like in the context of readers. Um, well, it's really, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a software issue. Even, even in your hardware reader, the, the reader would have to understand the HTML, the EPUB 3 structures that are new. So, I mean, the, the hardware itself, well, it depends. I suppose it depends on how the how the reader is baked into the into the hardware. Um, for your dedicated readers like the the Nook and the Kindle, yeah, that might be might be baked in. For something like like iBooks, um, that's really just a software application. It could be updated to support EPUB three, but the you know the companies that produce those readers have not yet done that. So I'm not not sure that actually answers the question, but. Um, fundamentally, it's a it's a software problem, right? Thank you, Elliot. Um, the next question has come in is, what are the benefits of DITA as compared to using JATS XML to generate EPUB three or HTML five documents? Uh, the benefits of DITA versus JATS XML. Um, well, I mean, it really depends on, um, I think, where you're where your content is coming from and what other publications you're working with. So, I mean, JATS is, is a vocabulary that's specifically designed for journals, right? And there's, there's a large um, infrastructure for, you know, within, within the journals community for, for using JATS and inter interchanging it. Um, it's not suitable, I, I mean, I, I would say it's not suitable as a more general vocabulary for Documentation generally, or even documents you would publish generally. Um, I mean, if you are exclusively or, or are or primarily a journal publisher, then it probably makes sense to use JAS as your, you know, as your XML vocabulary uh, for everything. Um, but if, if journals are only part of what you're doing, then I think DITA makes much more sense because it's the more general application. It has, you know, has a number of features that JAS doesn't have in terms of reusability and the other thing about the JAT environment is this JAT doesn't have the same level of sort of community tool support that DITA does. So that could be a problem as well. Because um, in my context, uh, you know, my role as a uh, systems integrator and, and XML consultant, I have, you know, worked on the problem of how do I generate EPUBs from, from JAT directly. And there's not the same... There's nothing that, that's comparable to the DIT Open Toolkit and DIT for Publishers in the JATS world. Uh, we were able to find some open source code, but it wasn't really that well supported, that sort of thing. So that, that could be an issue as well. Um, I have had clients that use DITA for journal content that published it, um, you know, to HTML and PDF uh, through DITA. They, they were um, an open access publisher, so they were looking at, you know, they had to minimize their, their budget. But I don't think they. I think they also weren't worried about inter, you know, interchanging with um, PubMed, for example. Um, 
So, I mean, I don't want to suggest that you should use data over JATS in all cases, but, I mean, obviously I have a little bit of a, <laughs> of a bit of bias. Um, yeah. Thank you, Elliot. <clears throat> the next question is, did you say CSS to PDF is available from all FO formatters? Did I say CSS? CSS to, to PDF. No, that's not, that's hopefully not what I said. It's certainly not what I intended to say. Uh, what I was saying was that from, from the FO formatters, it would be possible to generate HTML plus absolutely positioned CSS, right? So normally from our FO formatters, we would normally expect to produce PDF, right? You, you, you generate this intermediate file, your XSLFO file, you give those to your FO engine, it generates PDF as output. But all of those engines, certainly the, you know, uh, FOP, which is the open source engine, Antenna House XML Formatter and uh, XEP, RenderX XEP, they're all capable of producing either HTML uh, plus CSS directly or they produce an intermediate file uh, from which it would be easy to produce uh, HTML plus, plus CSS. So that's different. That's going from that's saying instead of generating PDF, I'm going to generate HTML plus CSS. It gives you the same visual layout that you would have had in your PDF. That's different from saying I'm, I've got CSS and I'm going to get PDF from that. Right? That's a different publishing route. Great. Thank you, Elliot. The next question has come in is, will EPUB ever be a delivered data OT output? Will it ever be a delivered OT? Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, in a sense, it is already because the, the data for publishers open toolkit plugins I mean, they're designed to just be plugged into the Open Toolkit. So even though they're not bundled with the Open Toolkit as it's, you know, as it comes from the Open Toolkit project, you can, you know, you can quickly and easily, in, you know, install the, the EPUB plugin there. Um, uh, some tool providers, so for example, Oxygen bundles the EPUB, the different publishers EPUB plugin, as well as its own uh, web help plugin with the Open Toolkit that that, you know, they provide out of the box with oxygen. Um, uh, another thing that, that's happening in the Open Toolkit itself is the Open Toolkit team is moving more and more towards having the, the toolkit itself be pretty minimal and everything be done through plugins and making it easier um, uh, to install those plugins. Um, so I, th I think what we'll see, I mean, one thing that I'm working on right now is, is making the data for publishers providing support for the 2.0, 2.x toolkit in data for publishers. Uh, once I get that working, um, then I can also provide some easier installation options to make it even easier to get the data for publishers plugins installed in your local open toolkit. So even though it's not out of the box, um, it, 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 it could be, I guess. Um, one of the reasons that I've never contributed the, the data for publishers plugin directly back to the open toolkit project was partly because you know they weren't always completely finished but also I didn't want to burden the open toolkit team which is you know only slightly bigger than my team of 1.5 um, with all that additional code right because it's you know why why just throw all that stuff in their lap so I don't know. so in that sense what do I try to say it's not out of the box with the toolkit, but it doesn't really matter that it's not out of the box. You can just, you know, have it there easily, quickly, and easily. Um, ho hopefully that's a satisfactory answer to the question. Great. Thank you, Elliot. And the next question has come in, and at this time it's the last question, is can you further explain the cross-linking capabilities? What are, What is the context where this would be used? Yeah, so I'll, I'll see how quickly I can do that because it's been, been a, a complicated subject. But fundamentally, if you if you've got a single data publication, you can create cross references from one topic to another topic within the context of that single publication, and you can do that with direct URL references. You can do it with keys, and that all works fine. If you want to have a link, say from you know book, you know your 
installation guide to your customization guide, which are two separate books, but you want to have a cross-reference from one to the other, there was no way before Data 1.3 to actually offer that reference um, in terms of a data source. There was no, Data didn't give you a way to, to, to reference either a key in another publication or to have a URL that went to another publication that was, that meant I'm linking to this topic as published in this other publication, right? One of the challenges with Data is that I have all these topics and then I pull all these topics together through a map. If I have a reference, if I have a cross-reference from one topic to another topic, and, and I'm just directly referencing that other topic, that reference doesn't tell me what maps are using this topic. So if that topic's used in two different publications, it's now ambiguous whether I want to link to the use of that topic in my publication or the use of that topic in another publication, right? For a cross-publication link, what I really want to be, need to be able to say is, I want to need to be able to say, I want to link to this topic as it's used in this other publication. And in Data 1.2 and earlier, there was no way to say that. Um, in Data 1.3, now I can say that. We have a way of letting you point to another root map and say explicitly, this other map is, you know, from the point of view of, of my publication, this other map is now the root, is to be treated as a root of a separate publication. And then I then have the ability to reference keys in that other publication, and therefore, as the author of my link, say, what I mean is absolutely, I'm linking to this topic as used in that other publication. Once you do that in the source, that provides enough information that your output processors can translate those those topic to topic references in your source to the appropriate you know HTML page to HTML page links or PDF file to PDF file links or HTML page to PDF file links or PDF file to HTML page links right whatever they might be um, so that's that's what it gives you um, it, it really something that you simply couldn't do in any well defined way before Data One Point Three. Great. Thank you, Elliot. Um, that's all the questions that have come in at this time. So I'd like to thank you for the very for the informative webinar. And I would like to thank our attendees um, for, for joining us today. This will conclude our webinar. Uh, you will be able to access the recorded version of this webinar in the archive section of our website located at www.dclab.com. Our next webinar will be next Tuesday, June 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time titled Going the Last Mile, Delivering Data Content to Mobile Devices, being presented by Dan Duby and Andre Duby. Thank you everyone for attending and have a great day. Bye-bye. Right.